Right before the pandemic, I met this guy organically on the streets of L.A. He invited me on a date. The date was amazing. Uh, it was immediate connection. The conversation flowed. Wherever there was a silence, it seemed like we were still connecting. Our eyes were always looking. We were so interested in each other. It was fun. He was definitely getting a second date. On our second date, we spoke more about our past accomplishments, our future endeavors, our dreams. And I noticed throughout the conversation, he was filling me up with some heavyweight compliments. Now look, <laughs> I love a good old compliment. But don't you know the saying, too much sugar ain't good for you? It just felt like this was a little too much too soon. And so I told him, I said, hey, you know, I, I don't know what's going on, but I'm not really feeling all of these compliments. He looked at me with genuine confusion and said, hmm, really? I don't know why I just gave him that voice, y'all. He did not talk like that. But for the sake of this story, just go along with me. I said, yeah, you know, I mean, it kind of feels a bit manipulative, you know, like there's an agenda behind it. So, you know, you don't have to say all that. He said, I want you to do something for me. I'm going to say something to you. And all I want you to say is, I know. I'm thinking, okay, you know what? I'm always down for a good exercise, so that's fine. We'll go along with this. It's still a nice date. He looked at me and said, Sophia, you are a great singer. <laughs> okay, this was going to be cute. I already knew this. I know, I said. You are a phenomenal actress. Tell the casting officers, but again, I already know this. I know. Sophia, you stand out and your work stands out. Okay, now he just met me. And how do, uh, I know. Sophia, uh, your art and the things you create are timeless. Okay, how long are we going to be doing this? I, mean, I, I know. You are brilliant. I know. You are powerful. Oh, I know. You are beautiful. Okay, <laughs> all right, buddy. I smiled. It suddenly dawned on me. It was only uncomfortable and manipulative because I hadn't owned it. <gasps> and then I thought, oh my God, he can see me. Oh, it was exhilarating. I, it was a bit scary, but it was cool because I felt safe. I felt safe because in a weird way, he was offering me my own power. Oh, I felt so seen. And that felt good. He was starting to look cuter. Now, here's the thing. I hadn't connected on that level with someone I was romantically interested in in a long time. Single ladies, y'all know what I mean. It had been years. And maybe that's what made it so refreshing. I had been craving it. So I was surprised to learn that some people believe the longer you've been single, the more difficult it is to be intimate and vulnerable with a potential partner. I mean, yeah, it may feel odd at first, but we're created for intimacy and for connection. And whether we're married or single, we can practice it in our daily lives. And that's what we're talking about today. How us single women practice intimacy with others and ourselves. Yes, self-intimacy. Oh, and as for me and that guy, we decided to just be friends. Different episode, different show. But for the maidens who were still a bit skeptical about his intentions, he continues to be my biggest cheerleader to this day. Turns out his love language, words of affirmation. You're listening to The Maiden Myth a podcast that challenges myths about single women, explores misconceptions about mature women, and celebrates the women breaking the mold of tradition. Today, we are exploring the myth, single women are missing out on intimacy. I can't front, I have definitely felt that way before. Maybe you've said, if only I had my person here with me, I wouldn't feel this way. Keep listening. And I think because of backgrounds and how we grew up and what we learned, we have this message that intimacy equals sex, and that's not the truth. I don't take care of myself to I have a certain status among people. I take care of myself to have 
I'm a place within myself where I feel safe. Ciao. I'm your host, Sophia Stevens. We'll be back after this quick break. Before we get started, make sure you're subscribed to The Maiden Myth on iTunes so each week when an episode drops, it will download straight to your device. Are you listening on Spotify? Watching on YouTube? Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you'll never miss an episode. I want to address this episode's myth by first defining intimacy. The first person joining this conversation is Abdi Zalea. She's a licensed professional counselor and Christian sex therapist for Aspen House Associates located in Dallas, Texas. So I want to start off with your definition of intimacy. I just want to talk about that first. like exactly, Because most of the times when we talk about intimacy, we think about sex. It's like we go straight yep. to sex. Yep. So why do we do that? And yep. what is it? Yeah. Well, and, and that's where I was going to start because I was going to say, you know, God. intimacy is not a, it's not synonymous with sex. And I think because of backgrounds and how we grew up and what we learned, we have this message that intimacy equals sex. And that's mm-hmm. not the truth. That's not true at all. So I think if we were to like go back to the basics and like pull up the dictionary and look at the definition of intimacy and what it actually means is um, to have familiarity, just the mm-hmm. closeness. And that's yeah. it, like plain and simple. But we like to complicate things. Why? Because we're human <laughs> beings. And also because we just pick up from all sorts of, you know, avenues and, and society and family and, and all of that. So I think I always like to start off and I'll ask even my clients or just people like, okay, how do you define intimacy? And then that's where I get to plug in like, okay, well, it sounds like we are boxing ourselves with, you know, intimacy only equals this. And when we do that, it takes away from really the beauty of what intimacy is, which is a closeness to be familiar, to be known, to be seen, to be safe, to be understood. And that encompasses, I I almost want to say like intimacy is like this big umbrella and underneath that you can experience so many other things in so many different ways. And I think for a lot of single, you know, men and women, it's believers, they're like, well, I can't experience that because I'm not married. Um, But really we look at like, to be intimate is to be seen, to be known. And how can I accomplish that outside of sex or what I think it looks like? So the first reason the myth isn't true is because you don't have to be married or in a relationship to experience intimacy. I feel like we all kind of knew that. And thank God, because a 2018 national survey revealed a third of married couples reported feeling lonely in their marriages. I know. Lonely and married. There was a time I would have considered that to be an oxymoron, but it's not. Some people are not experiencing intimacy or even connection with their spouses. But here's some good news. You don't need a man to practice intimacy, y'all. And there are many ways to do it. Okay, I'm going to use the next 90 seconds to review the four common areas of intimacy that Abdi mentioned. For some of you, this will be a reminder. Others, you may learn something. Here we go. First, emotional intimacy. This is allowing yourself to be known in an emotional way. That would include sharing your feelings or what you are emotionally experiencing with someone you trust. Whether it be joy or sorrow, fear or courage, this includes the bad as well as being comfortable with sharing the good. Then there's mental intimacy or intellectual intimacy. This is sharing your ideas or your perspectives, especially the unpolished ones. I've experienced this type of intimacy often with colleagues in spaces designed for creativity or for brainstorming, but it happens whenever we feel safe to share our opinions or our views. Next, spiritual intimacy. This is when you feel safe to share your faith, your beliefs, or even existential questions like, what is the meaning and the purpose of one's life? Now, you don't have to be of the same faith or agree on these issues to experience spiritual intimacy with another person. But when you do, it heightens the intimacy. And then there's physical intimacy. No, not quite. If we consider the basic meaning of intimacy, closeness, well, physical intimacy is welcoming someone to get close to your body. And this can include a massage from a therapist, holding hands in prayer with a stranger, a mother and child cuddling, a hug from grandma, a kiss from a lover, or now we can go there. Hot, steamy, sex. 
All right. Oh, I did it. That was 90 seconds. The key is knowing each of these areas of intimacy can be practiced and explored without a romantic partner. And intimacy isn't even limited to these four areas. Have you ever heard of experiential intimacy? Like where you share different experiences with people? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and I think, you know, again, thinking of intimacy and like the type of experience you want to have. So right. I know I listed off like very four basic or bigger topics, but I think with intimacy, just using that definition, that closeness, that familiarity, and then insert whatever experience you want to have and being able to share that experience. Are you experiencing that closeness, that familiarity, feeling safe? And I do want to add like the safety piece to it um, because that, that is something that you experience in intimacy, right? You feel safe. Now, if we don't feel safe, well, that's not very intimate. If intimacy is our desired destination, vulnerability is the vehicle that gets us there. And this ride is scary because allowing yourself to be known doesn't guarantee acceptance or safety even from a loved one. This is probably the biggest deterrent that keeps people from practicing intimacy. Maybe you've experienced judgment. I know I've experienced my share of rejection and ridicule. Maybe you've even experienced abuse after revealing yourself to another person. Depending on how great the offense, I can attest it can take a lot of time to recover. Now, if you're single, you probably don't have the same impetus as someone who's married to be vulnerable again. Now, this is probably a reason why people may prefer to remain single, but the idea that being single actually prevents you from practicing intimacy and being vulnerable, that's just not true at all. But let's go ahead and explore this with Abdi anyway. So do you think that the longer someone has been single, the more difficult it is? to become vulnerable? That is a good question. I wonder if we're limiting, you know, the thought that when you're single, you can't be vulnerable with other people. So we're talking okay. about vulnerability in a romantic relationship or vulnerability with just human beings, period. I would say vulnerability in a romantic relationship. But you know what? As you say that, if you're practicing vulnerability in your daily life mm -hmm. and you're not trapped in the thought that it's only reserved for a particular relationship yeah. and in this particular way, it will be nothing to yeah. transfer this to. Because what is a marriage or a relationship other than friendship? <laughs> it's like... Exactly. Yeah. Because well, if you, you are allowing yourself to be vulnerable outside of a romantic relationship, that's a muscle, right, that we're using to be able, when we think about vulnerability, um, it's being open, exposing yourself, um, try, basically, I always like imagine it like I'm opening myself to being seen and known, and that part is scary because I risk the possibility of being hurt. But I can be vulnerable with friends. I could be vulnerable with my colleagues. I could be vulnerable with my family. And in a romantic relationship, I can also be vulnerable. But I think when we, you know, like tag vulnerability with romantic relationships and because I'm single, then I don't have that. So I can't be vulnerable. Well, then, yeah, it's going to be really hard when you're yeah. in a relationship. But if you allow yourself to practice that vulnerability, it might look different mm -hmm. when you are in a romantic relationship, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be harder. Right. Um, or you won't be able to. Do you think it can be just as rich or is there a different level of intimacy within the marriage? I think there's a level, a different level. Um, just like it's different being with your best friends and family. It's just different. Um, I think wow. at the sex therapist in me, I, I do want to celebrate just the beauty and, you know, God's intention in, um, like marriage and connecting in that way, which I will also add the caveat that that does not mean that your um, relationship status means that, you know, you're good or bad or not fulfilling mm -hmm. something. I'm not saying that at all. Mm -hmm. And I hope that that is not something that is limiting other single people. And like, it becomes a thing like now I'm failing as a believer. No, that is not at all. Mm -hmm. And because even when we look at the Bible and it says mm -hmm. like, it's like singleness is a gift. Okay, right. well then let's embrace that gift. And right. it does not mean that I'm not 
good enough of a Christian. Um, one of the things that I like to celebrate when it comes to like marriage and intimacy, when we look at the Bible and it talks about, um, you know, like knowing whatever spouse, like Adam knew Mm -hmm. Eve. So that type of known, I know we say like, oh, it's a biblical term for like having sex. Having sex with someone. Right. However, if we go deeper and actually I think the Hebrew word is yada, and that actually means to know. And that is so much more than just having sex. It's to know the inner, more most intimate parts of that person. And the beautiful part about that is that we have that type of connection with God. Like yeah. he knows us, yeah. right? When you have your husband or wife, your spouse, you know them in a more yeah. intimate way. And it doesn't mm-hmm. just mean sex. Sex is just an added bonus. Like, cool, we right. get to celebrate that. But you know the most intimate inner parts of that person that you are spending a majority part of your life with and you live with them and you just know all the things so in I don't want to say like it's richer it's just different and you can celebrate the complexities of being in that relationship and then when you're single you can celebrate the complexities of being intimate with other single individuals that you might not be able to when you're married That's Um, true. and being able to celebrate the gift of each singleness and you know marriage When we come back, we have a new guest, and we're going to explore how you can practice intimacy with yourself. The Made in Myth podcast appreciates the support of every listener. We enjoy creating content that empowers women. And although our team is modest in size, we're committed to sharing quality content. This, of course, requires more time, effort, and money. If you love what you're hearing and want to hear more, please consider donating to our podcast. No donation is too small. Links are available on this podcast page. You can also make a contribution at themaidenmyth.com. Thank you. Now, back to our show. First, who are you? Hey. <laughs> I'm Ashley Wonko, and I am, let's see, who am I on the inside? I'm a child of the most high. This is Ashley unprompted. I am love. I am so appropriate for a conversation on intimacy. And I am exuberant. Not a lot of people do this. Also, on the outside, I am black, Galifuna American, kids life coach, first generation, low income college student at 35 years old. No, I'm just playing. I uh, <laughs> All of that. There's right. so many parts to it. But professionally, kids life coach, family partnership, uh, professional author, and just a lover of people, a lover of God. I love Jesus, Holy Spirit, community, um, growing and learning, learning who we are across time and how we can bring more of the best of who we are from the ancient into the present. Ladies and gentlemen, Ashley Blanco. Once again, I started our conversation on intimacy. Ashley likes to use Iyanla Van Zandt's definition, into me, you see. I love that one. I was going to continue, but then she mentioned something else. I'm also looking at this book by uh, Sabon Fu Somme. And I read it a while ago, but I've got to get back into it, The Spirit of Intimacy. And it's so good because she talks about... um, the spirits coming together without the interference of the mind, you know? And so just thinking about that is like, you know, and not to make the mind evil, but whenever we intellectualize a connection, even trying to calculate how close we can get to someone, now we're starting to distance ourselves from the authenticity of the interaction, you know, or the the authenticity of reaching the essence of a person, you know. So um, when I think about her, her exploration of this topic, it makes me think a lot about how what we assume intimacy to be or not be often gets in the way of us actually experiencing it. Interesting. So we actually block our own experiences of intimacy based off of what we think intimacy should be. Mm-hmm, 
And here's the thing. Um, we're not conditioned many times to be intimate, depending on what type of family we grow up in. You know, I was with a family last week and they are very, you, you could say they're very intimate because they um, allow themselves to be vulnerable um, with each other, they can express their emotions. The kids can say what they like and don't like. They can, you know, climb on the furniture. They're also not just with each other, but they're part of this community where there's a certain level of openness. And again, culturally, some kids, they may not be their experience. You know, may, they may not have the opportunity to express themselves. Uh, they may not receive the same level of attentiveness to their emotional expression. That initial lack of attentiveness impacts the way we go about intimacy, right? Mm -hmm. Intimacy sounds scary because it sounds like sexual or sensual and very close. But to be intimate is simply to be open, you know, um, to allow yourself to be seen, to be honest. And there's a certain level of risk. But I think what makes intimacy work is the parties involved, it's a mutual agreement to take a risk. Mutual agreement to take a risk? <laughs> Allow me, I've got a little experience with this one. Last year, I met up with my dear friend, big sister, Teresa, for a night out in New York. We were going to see MJ, the musical on Broadway. It was phenomenal. You may remember Teresa because she's the first woman I interviewed for this podcast, and she's currently in episode one. I was waiting for her in a restaurant when she floated in with an incredibly vibrant, beautiful, funky coat that eventually she admitted she was uneasy about wearing. You see, Teresa's modest at heart, but her style, oh, it's impeccable. It's vibrant and louder than she is. The coat was saying, ma'am, you need to stop and look at me. But that's not Teresa at all. We laughed about how much courage it took for her to wear the coat because every time she wears it, as she puts it, it garners so much attention. I reminded her that she gets attention no matter what she wears. This was not me gassing my friend up. So often people stop her and notice her inner light. I once ran into her while out with another friend of mine, and as we walked away, my friend asked, Who is she? She has such a beautiful spirit. She was touched by that reminder and decided at that moment she was going to rock her coat just as she rocked her inner light. Whoop! She was not kidding about how much attention that coat got. <laughs> I lost count of how many times people stopped us to either praise her style or ask where she got the coat. It went from amusing to hilarious to a little annoying. But ultimately, I was so proud of my friend for owning all of her uniqueness and beauty. She was equally as touched for the encouragement I gave her. About a month later, February, she asked me if I had received anything in the mail. I told her no. She was concerned because she had sent me a gift nearly a month ago, and it seems the good old postal service done lost it. The next month, March, she asked if I'd receive anything again. I told her no. I could hear the frustration in her voice. She told me she was going to sort it out with the company and I would receive something soon. She said, you will get this gift. My curiosity was growing. Finally. Four months from her purchasing the item, I received a package in the mail. I was so happy because whatever it was, it took great pain to finally get it to me. As I felt the package, my stomach dropped. Call it intuition or common sense because I know my friend, but before opening it, I knew what it was. And I was right. She had purchased me a cropped version of the incredibly vibrant, beautiful, funky coat that she wore. It was a nice coat, but I didn't like it. I didn't like it for me. It wasn't my style. Like, I'm the girl who can wear black unapologetically every day. And then I thought, oh, my God. How am I going to tell her? 
will I need to wear this? I couldn't bear the thought of hurting my friend, especially after knowing everything she went through to get me this coat. Oh, I nearly became angry. Doesn't she know me? When have I ever worn something like this? And then I got scared. Will she think I'm ungrateful? Will she be uninspired to gift me with something again? Oh, Lord, this is going to be the last gift. I panicked, y'all. But then I got an idea. I'll just send her a picture of me wearing the coat with a big smile so she'll know I'm happy. And then I'll text her, thank you for your kindness and enduring the trouble to get me the gift. Perfect. No lies told, honesty preserved, and send. It was late, so I wouldn't see her response until the morning. I would have to wait and pray this was sufficient. The next day, I woke up to two text messages. One was Teresa loving the message, as all you Apple users do. And the other was a message of happiness and gratitude that I'd finally received the gift. All was well until Sunday, which happened to be Easter Sunday. She called me. I could tell something was up, but before I could ask, she spoke her truth. It went a little something like this. I thought you would have called to thank me rather than send a text. There's something about hearing someone's voice. You can really tell how they feel about it. And I guess a part of my excitement was looking forward to hearing your excitement. Oh my God, I had to give it to her. I mean, honestly, it took courage to call out this moment. I paused and I thought about it. She was absolutely right. And it was something I would have normally done. I would have called had I really liked the gift. But you see, I was avoiding a tough conversation. Or worse, lying to my friend. And so I took the easy route that left her feeling unappreciated and a little in the dark about how I really felt. I apologized to her. I knew better. And I had to be careful here. Because she was only upset about me not calling her. So I carefully appreciated her once again for the coat and for her kindness of going through all that trouble to get me this coat. Oh, you're welcome, sweetie. But do you like it? My friend was not letting up. Why did she have asked me that? <laughs> like the coat? D do I like the coat? Yeah, I hear you saying that you are appreciative of me going through the trouble, but I, I still haven't heard you say you like it. It didn't take her long to see how I was clearly skirting around the issue. At this point, I was literally sweating, y'all, like sweating. My fear was to lie and say, I love it, and then have her purchase more things like that or ask why I haven't worn it. But another fear, just as palpable, was that I would upset my friend and risk losing her. Nevertheless, I courageously told the truth. I admitted, I didn't like that coat. That it was an incredible coat for her. And I loved it on her. And she rocked it. Clearly. But it wasn't me. She was quiet and then said, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I knew it. I could read through the text, the smile and the avoidance, and I had a feeling, but I needed to hear you say it. I told her I didn't want to hurt her. And then she gave me the best gift ever. She reminded me that this is the only way our friendship can grow, through honesty and navigating these tough conversations. See, you are giving me an inside look into who you are. And I have to know, as a giver, it's not going to always be a hit or miss. Teresa then shared with me a similar experience she had gone through that didn't quite end the same way. You see, one day she smelled a pleasant fragrance on a pier of hers and complimented her on how wonderful she smelled. Soon after... Her peer gifted her with the same fragrance. Unfortunately, it was something Teresa wouldn't wear, 
And so she gracefully told her, thank you, but this was not her scent and declined the gift. Child, that woman made it very clear that that was offensive and disrespectful. And that was it for them. After that experience, Teresa said she would always give space for people to be honest. She believes even giving is a risk because you're making an assumption the person is looking forward to the specific gift just as much as you are. And that is not always the case. Oh, I was so grateful for her, even more than I'd ever been. That moment reminded me there is vulnerability in giving and receiving. But what I appreciated most was her making it clear it's always safe to be honest with her. And that's the word that I didn't mention so far, but that's the key, safety. Like you are safe to be seen. You are safe to be seen. Now, this is my second point. Sophia, people have to be ready to be seen. You have to be willing to be seen because I've been around people. I have a spiritual attunement. We all do. Some of us is a little stronger than others. I've been around people who have seen into me spiritually, highly spiritually or deeply spiritually attuned women. They saw into me and I wasn't ready. And it scared me and I had to get myself together. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't want to be around them. Yeah. And I've had that effect on people too. It takes conditioning and courage to be seen and remain out of hiding. Sometimes it's simply a matter of fully accepting yourself. Single women who leverage their alone time to embrace and nurture their unique voice, their beauty, and their God-given power in spite of their weaknesses are practicing a form of self-intimacy that not only affects themselves, but also affects the world. This is radical self-care. Rooted in and popularized by women of the Black Panther Party, like Erica Huggins and Angela Davis, self-care is feminism. Self-care is revolutionary. Self-care properly practiced is soul care. Chef's kiss. There are parts of me that have, that I have loved less because I was taught not to love that. Not just by family, but by community or by society. Now, this is another way we get intimacy wrong or self-care wrong. We think that self-care is just about nails and hair. and Take care of yourself. Do the wonderful stuff, right? But when, when there is an issue within you that needs to be addressed, maybe it's someone keeps coming your way and they irritate you about something and you just have to, it, it, it may not be necessarily that the issue is within you, but it's how you respond. Right? God Love wants it. you to take care of that because self-care properly uh, practices soul care. And with that soul care element, self-care is self-work. We have to do our work. You just said self-care is self-work. Yes. You are not doing the work if you're just, look, your house has plumbing issues and you want to get a new door. Oh, <laughs> how dare you? Look, wow. Your kitchen is out of order and you want to put up a fence. Excuse me. <laughs> Stop <Yeah>. deflecting. <laughs> We're just going to put some succulents down. The foundation is shifting. <laughs> if you need succulents, we need to fix the foundation. Oh, my gosh. I love that so much, man. But it takes so much work to fix the plumbing. It you takes don't. so much time and work to fix the structure. It's you overwhelming. Don't. So you're like, let me just get some flowers out here. Right. This is just go Wow. Your self-care is more essential than flowers. And more essential than serving as a flex. Status and self-care don't go together for me. I don't take care of myself to uh, have a certain status among people. I take care of myself to have um, a place within myself where I feel safe, where I can be consistent, where I can act with integrity. 
So when we think about soul care, your soul care starts with you, but it doesn't end with you. It goes out into the world. Ugh, I just love that. You know you are self-caring right when it positively impacts the way you care for those around you. That includes becoming intimate with yourself in all of the areas we explored earlier, whether through physical intimacy by honoring your body by what you eat and do, spiritual intimacy through meditation, journaling and prayer, mental intimacy by trying something new or protecting your mental peace, or emotional intimacy, being honest with yourself, or... Here's something. Look at the parts of you that need more love. Where have you been made to feel like you are wrong for wanting the things that life naturally offers you? Being able to express, I felt this way, learning how to express your emotions. We have to learn how to express ourselves, what happened without the emotional charge. Soul care can help you do that. But that that's where therapy comes in for some if they need help with that. Coaching can help with that. Um, Friends who, you know, are on the same path with you and you're kind of, you know, your friend tours, you know, mentoring friends. Friend tours. I like that. Let's talk about friendships. They're incredibly important and one of the places we get to exercise our intimacy muscles. These relationships often influence who you are, how you see yourself, and even where you go in life. As I've gotten older, I've become much more intentional about who I choose to have in my friendship circle. I mean, I'm just as selective with my friends as I am with the men I choose to date. I asked Ashley how we can develop strong friendships that allow us to practice intimacy. The first thing is asking yourself, can the real me stand up in this relationship? Or can the real me Is the real me approaching this relationship? We need skills to be real with each other. And that goes back to soul care. How do you be real in a friendship with someone who is trying to get their needs met? You got to have constant conversation. Be honest. Hey, I noticed this. You know, can you tell me more about that? That's the easy one. That's one of my favorites. I noticed this. Can you tell me more? (laughs) Um, Being able to have fun. If you can't have fun with someone, If everything is always a hardship or a venting session, it's probably not a full relationship. You know, relationships, and I'm speaking specifically to friendships because they're relationships too. They need a, a balanced level of security and adventure. Now, two people, they may just sit around and talk and have coffee and tea and that's it. And that's just enough for them. But you've got to agree on what the friendship is going to be for both of you. Yes, but also, if you just sit around and have tea together because you said something I've never heard before, security and adventure, maybe the adventure is mental adventure. Mm. Maybe the adventure, because when I talk to you, we haven't gone anywhere, but our conversations (laughs) have gone to the moon and back where I'm like, what is happening here? Mm. And your mind is opening. So there's, I love that. I love that security and adventure, safety and adventure. It's like, I feel safe here, but we are about to discover some stuff. It can be physical. It can be emotional. It can be mental. It can be spiritual, but it is a ride. Yes. We got to have that that. because, you know, I realize some of the people, I don't know, say no names, but some of the people that I've been friends with are boring. (laughs) And I'm like, you're not growing. Or they may be talking about the small things. Yeah, Yeah, that's true. You know, like maybe they are growing, but they're over there. (laughs) And that is okay. And acceptance is key in friendships too. realizing when the relationship has changed. You guys have different, you ladies have different interests. You know, um, but I think what makes a friendship fun for people or a friendship worth having is checking in on, is it meeting your needs? You know, and it doesn't have to be a serious conversation to where people are leaving sweaty and bloody and scared. It doesn't have to be that. Right. 
Thank you again to our lovely guests, Abdi Zalea and Ashley Blanco. If you want more information on these women, their links are on our podcast page. And if you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to share, rate, and review. We want to hear from you. Here at The Maiden Myth, we replace fallacy with fact, trickery with truth, and assumption with assertion. It seems only right to counter the myth that began our episode with a powerful affirmation. Today's affirmation is, I am courageous and I am wise. I open my heart to those who reciprocate my trust. The Maiden Myth Podcast is produced by Philosophia Productions, mixed by Sanka Nguyen. The music supervisor is Johnny Steele. The managing producer, Life Creative Group. Assistant producers, Sarah Benibo and Ronald and Doretta Stevens. Special thanks to Michelle Adewumni and Jennifer Edison. Want more? Join the Maiden Myth community at themaidenmyth.com. You can also find us on every podcast platform, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, where you can leave a comment and join in the conversation.